Hey Denver, it's Paul. I'm a producer on the show, and this weekend we have something special for you. It's an episode from our friends at the Elevated Denver Podcast, which is all about humanizing the homelessness crisis and talking about real solutions. And this one is really cool, because if you're a regular listener, you know how much attention we've been paying to the mayor's race. But there are still issues we haven't had the chance to go deep on. Fortunately, Elevated Denver was able to get both remaining candidates, Kelly Bruff and Mike Johnston, to sit for extended interviews on the issues related to housing and homelessness. So I'll drop some links in the show notes if you want to learn more about Elevated Denver and subscribe to their show. But that's all from me. Enjoy! think about the way the world is and the way that the world could be. All of our systems are interrelated and interdependent. There's a thousand different voices that nobody hears. We're looking at a human being and there's life story. 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 Connection to the people we don't know that live near us. An Elevated Denver starts now. Welcome back to the Elevated Denver podcast. This is Leanne. I'm here with Jana and Myra, and we're coming to you with a special episode featuring Denver's two mayoral runoff candidates. We are in the middle of an important election that will set the trajectory of our city for at least the next four years. In April, there were 17 candidates on the ballot for mayor. Not surprisingly, none of those candidates received the majority vote, so we are now in a runoff election. The two mayoral candidates who received the highest percentage of votes were Kelly Bruff and Mike Johnston. Kelly and Mike both agreed to sit down with us and talk about their plans for tackling one of the most pressing issues of our time, homelessness. We interviewed each candidate separately and asked them the same set of questions, which were informed by our unhoused neighbors. We wanted to give Kelly and Mike the opportunity to go a little deeper on what they are planning and why. Though they are proposing different approaches, both candidates advocate for a community-based response that engages those with lived experience in addressing homelessness. We want to thank each of the candidates, and we're really looking forward to sharing these conversations with you, which are being brought to you with the support of Warren Village and Rose Community Foundation. Could you please introduce yourself? Yes, my name is Mike Johnston. I'm a candidate for mayor of Denver. When you think about homelessness, what comes to mind? What comes to mind for me are the people I've talked to and had conversations with. I mean, the one that comes to mind right now is standing in line outside of a shelter in the morning during breakfast and talking to a gentleman who was sitting there with a construction hat in his bag. And I asked him, you know, are you working construction? He said, yeah, I have been for 11 months. He said, last night was actually the first night I've been back in a shelter in 11 months. I said, why? He said, well, you know, I served two tours in Iraq. I was a veteran and came home and got injured and in my rehab, got addicted to opioids uh, and have been trying to get clean for a while and struggled. But now I'm going to a methadone clinic and I have you know appointments a couple mornings a week. But the problem is I got to get on a bus at 530 to get to my clinic. And if I'm going to do a construction shift, I also got to be at the site at 530 in the morning to be able to get on that shift. And so every day I got to pick, am I going to go to treatment or am I going to go to work? And this was a hard week, and I knew I wasn't going to make it if I didn't go to treatment. So, uh, so I went to treatment. I missed my shift. I couldn't pay my bill at the hotel, and they kicked me out. And so now I'm back homeless for the first time. And I just think about that story and how hard he's working to get his life back together, how much he's given to this country, and how little it would take for us to help him get back on his feet if we did it the right way. Could you please introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Kelly Bruff. I'm a candidate for Denver mayor. When you think about homelessness, what comes to mind? I think for me today, what comes to mind first is a humanitarian crisis. And this maybe comes from just spending time talking with people who are living unhoused and and seeing the conditions that they're living in and the struggle. So one of the things I do when I talk with people who are unhoused today and I meet them, I've gone to a few encampments, I ask them a question of, if I had a safer place for you to go, uh, would you go? 
And, you know, I mean, I can honestly tell you 100%. Listen, maybe 99. But most recently, I talked with a woman, Sharon, who said to me, um, and it was very emotional. She just, uh, she was begging to go to a safer location. And I share that because I think it's really important we understand the situation people are finding themselves in and how desperate they are for our help. And that I think we're capable of doing more than we're doing today. What do you see as a root cause of homelessness in our community? This probably comes to from talking with people. The range is so huge from, you know, women who were escaping maybe domestic violence or uh, certainly young people who whose maybe families weren't accepting, you know, as LGBTQ plus community members, veterans. I certainly have met a number of veterans, people who've been in our justice system trying to find a path back. Uh, the range is huge. And, you know, the other thing that really stood out to me is people's self-awareness. It was so incredibly high. Uh, when I talk to people, they'll describe, you know, a struggle with an addiction, a struggle maybe with uh, behavioral health or mental health needing support. I think that's why it requires, you know, a really intentional but personal response to help address what people need um, to be housed again and supported. I think there's a lot of misperception about this. I think there are three overlapping root causes. Uh, one is simply the housing crisis we've created in this city by having skyrocketing housing prices because a lot more folks that want to live here, prices are going up and up, and we're building fewer and fewer units and fewer and fewer units that are actually affordable. So there's fewer places for folks to live. That's a big one. Second, I think, is mental health support, as we used to have infrastructure for much better mental health support for people, including inpatient mental health beds, if you needed that. We closed most of those facilities that offered that kind of mental health treatment, and then we're suddenly surprised and those people didn't just disappear. They still have those same needs. We're just not treating them. Then I think the third is a real rise in levels of addiction um, and in a real drop in the kind of services we need to support people in various levels of addiction, whether that is outpatient treatment or inpatient treatment. And so I think those three causes overlapping plus COVID uh, have created a real crisis uh, in the city where we can see how we got here. None of it was for ill intent. I mean, these are people from our own communities that were previously getting services and we're not serving them well now. And so they're struggling uh, more and more. And I think that should give us some hope that because we know what those causes are, we know how to address those causes. What responsibility do you believe homeless individuals have in their situation? I think they have a responsibility to do everything they can to access the resources that are there to help them be successful, knowing that you're going to be in different stages of capacity to access that. And that's not just true for folks who are unhoused. You know, I have relatives who are addicts and uh, sometimes they're doing well and they're able to get back up on their feet and get a job. And other times they're not. And they're just dysfunctional and stealing from their parents and doing a, taking every dollar they can find and putting it into addiction. And they're not in a spot where they're going to help themselves right now. And so it requires more support from family or others. And so I think Everyone who's unhoused has the obligation to use all the resources at their disposal to try to get access to help. And there are times when their needs are going to dramatically limit how many of those resources they can use. And that's a place where we have to figure out what else we can do as a community of neighbors, the same way you would as a family, to say, okay, you're not in a great spot to take care of yourself now. How can we help you get access to the services you would be accessing if you were in a better spot? This is so interesting, right? People either believe you're unhoused because you couldn't afford to live, it's expensive to live here, or because you have a mental health or an addiction issue. And uh, just like what we described, right, it's complex. And I guess uh, we want to place personal responsibility on people. Uh, but my own family's experience is life is hard and it's complex. And typically people want what's best for them and best for others. And the challenge is being able to find a path to it. So I guess I would say, like most things in life, I think it's a shared responsibility between community and individual. But I probably see almost every aspect of our lives that way. We know more short-term housing and long-term affordable housing is needed in Denver. Tell us what you are proposing to address short-term transitional housing and long-term housing needs. I think probably one of the things that informs me the most is when I saw the numbers of people who've died unhoused in our region. And just to give your listeners context, I think more than 170 people died last year. The year before, more than 250. I think there's an urgency and I think it's a crisis. 
So I understand the challenges having met with so many service providers about being able to get everybody indoors immediately. So what I would do uh, short term is sanction uh, outdoor sites temporarily, but that we could get people to safer locations as quickly as possible. That would include, though, for me, the safe parking. Uh, You know, we've seen the Colorado Village Collaborative work, but an urgency to get people to safer locations and save lives. And then uh, really focusing on how do we get everyone indoors uh, and, frankly, the support and services that they desperately want and need. Um, And this is another place where I really feel strongly we have to do this work as a region. I don't think we can do it alone. You know, today, Denver really has the the supports and services for people who are unhoused. And so you see a concentration in our downtown. Uh, But we're not serving people well. Um, And I don't think it works in the neighborhoods where people are trying to get those services when they're so concentrated. So I met with mayors throughout our region to say, I think we have to do this together if we're going to really be successful. And six mayors in the metro area endorsed that approach. Um, And I think it's going to require that we do that work together to house and shelter people but probably mostly to make sure we have beds to support people as they struggle with addiction and try to find a path to sobriety or the mental health supports they need. Um, And I think that's the work we absolutely have to do as a region as well. You know, one of the things I feel like you have to always be doing as an adult, although this is discouraged when you're running for office, is learn. Um, And I, I continue to try to learn and understand what could we do. But Councilwoman Ortega shared... Uh, Three locations that I think in our region have real potential for that kind of transitional housing where we could get you indoors with supports and services. And there's one in Arapahoe County, one in Hudson and Fort Logan. And so I'm interested in continuing conversations with the state on how we could use state resources to assist with transition, um, recognizing going straight sometimes from living unhoused to a more traditional housing arrangement often doesn't work, um, puts people at risk with an addiction, uh, but also that need to be able to be outdoors quickly. I'm also really interested in the transition of, you know, we have office space throughout our city and our region. We have small hotels, motels. I think these could also be spaces that might make a lot of sense. And together, uh, we could look at how we might, you know, refurbish or uh, re-adapt those uses uh, for the kind of use we need today. I spent a, a lot of time on this, and for me, I've shared this a lot. This was really one of the major reasons why I chose to run for mayor, which is I both felt like this problem was getting tougher and tougher, and we were being less and less successful, and it was clear to me that it was really a solvable problem, that there were ways we could show up differently and make a much different impact. And so um, my focus for our approach has really been built on the providers in this community who have developed really great solutions and learning from those, learning from the others around the country. And the first part for me is we know we have to get people access to housing and access to housing we can build quickly and we can build affordably. And so what I've proposed doing is uh, expanding a lot of our um, of our what I call micro communities, which are you take half acre or acre vacant lots around the city, you put tiny homes on those sites, you allow people to move to those tiny homes where they have stability and dignity and privacy and have their own place for storage and have a bed and have access to kitchens and bathrooms and showers, but more importantly, then bring the wraparound services onto those sites. So you can get access to addiction treatment right there. You can get access to mental health support. You can get access to workforce training. You get access to long-term housing support. And finally, it allows people to actually protect the sense of community that many folks have built when they're unhoused, which is if you're living in an encampment with seven or eight people, those are often the community that you have left or the community you've chosen. And when we try to break those communities up, we know that can have a real negative impact. The power of the micro communities are you open a micro community and you can come to two or three blocks of folks who are living together unhoused and say, we want to rehouse you as a community into a place that actually gives you the stability and services you need. And we know that really works. And I want to do that intentionally and deliberately at scale so that everybody who is currently unhoused can really get access to the stability and services they need to get back on their feet. I think those are a really important part of the transitional housing plan for me because you get people, you know, you're, you got air conditioning, you got heat, you got a locked door, you're not going to freeze to death. You also have important things like a physical address. So if you want to apply for a job, people can actually send you information in the mail or you can they can get back to you for an interview. If you have treatment or needs that you want to get in place, you can, then you get some training, get a first job, get a first couple months of paychecks that you can build up to then move into a a more permanent unit. But we know 
to your point, there's a whole shortage of those units also out there. So we got to solve both parts of the problem at the same time. We got to get people access to dignified and stable sh- transitional housing while we significantly expand our supply of longer term housing, which is units that people can afford to move into when they're making twenty or $30,000 a year uh, working jobs. And so uh, I think it's a matter of doing both. I'm happy to talk more about the, the long term housing, but there my vision is to build 25,000 units across the metro area that would be permanently affordable, which would mean no one that lives in them ever has to pay more than 30% of whatever they make to rent. And most importantly, they stay permanently affordable so you don't have any fear that the landlord's going to jack up your rent at the end of the next month and you'll be pushed back out on the street again. We need that kind of stability and that long-term consistency so people can build lives around them, which right now it's just month to month. How do you attend to some of the more population-specific needs, for instance, folks who identify as transgender or non-binary or folks who have disabilities and um, have mobility issues. I think what I like about the idea of these micro communities is it does allow choice. So if when you have 10 or 20 of these around the city, like for instance, if you go to the Colorado Village Collaborative one in North Park Hill now, one of the communities they're opening now is focused explicitly on women and trans and non-binary individuals who want to have a community of people that share that certain experience or that certain um, identity. And so, uh, and similarly, another one allows for families and for service pets. And so the benefit is when you have different kinds of communities, you can allow for choice for communities that are important to people. I think this allows for smaller sense of community and identity and for people to choose into those identities that are most meaningful to them. This is where I think we also have to really revamp our shelters. You know, our shelter system was one that was built on congregate sheltering basically for straight white men, if we're really honest about it. And that's not at all uh, who is the, uh, you know, only people living unhoused in our city. And so, you know, one of the things when you look around the nation at who's doing a better job at housing and sheltering and providing services, you really notice really good data helps where you start to assess what programs really worked and for whom. Uh, Where do we have gaps? Uh, You know, not enough beds. In December, we had three beds for women. I assure you, when I was meeting with people in encampments, hundreds and hundreds of women were unhoused. So I think we have to adapt our shelters, that your belongings are safe, you're safe. You can stay in the community that you're forming. You're welcome there. Uh, Your partner is welcome there. Uh, Your family is welcome. And I think this is a key part of, as we think about the system we're building in the future, as we start to identify our gaps, I would really focus on those populations who have had nowhere to go. We have heard from our own interviews with over 25 unhoused individuals about the challenges to understanding and accessing available services, such as getting linked with a case manager or getting an ID. What solutions are you proposing that address these breakdowns or inefficiencies in the system? The city of Denver has I th- um, a number of outreach workers today who are doing this work. I think it's just critical uh, that we continue to look at, do we have the right number and, and frankly, the right diversity uh, of outreach workers doing the work uh, to providing the support and help, um, and then partnering with all the nonprofits who work in this space. I'm also interested, though, in how could we engage the private sector a little more in this work? Um, you know, I've heard huge range of estimates uh, about the number of people who are unhoused and You know, to me, this includes people who are couch surfing and um, living in their cars and and how many have jobs. And, you know, the estimates are around 40 percent. And so I think there's a huge opportunity to work with employers, um, uh, public, private and nonprofit. But recognizing these are our employees and what could we do together that could increase the support and service we're providing. Otherwise, I don't think we can make the kind of progress we need to make. This is another one of the reasons why when I looked at what was working, why I think these micro communities are so effective is you can then deliver services to people much more easily when you know exactly where they are. They're in a community where they have an address. You can come bring the health and human services one day to provide access to services. You can bring the DMV one day to be able to print IDs. Uh, you can bring buyout industries to come, buyout industries to come and do workforce training all all on site. I was talking to the woman who was saying, you know, yeah, you know, I have my own tent and I'm out here and I close it every night, but she said, Two nights ago, I was sleeping. Someone came by, 
used a straight razor to cut my tent open, reached in and stole my phone before I even realized it. You know, talked to another guy who had his phone stolen out of a shelter. He had a job cleaning floors at a record shop, and but he got his phone stolen, can't call his boss back, can't see what time his next shift is. It makes any ability to get yourself into a position of work or services much more difficult if you don't have that kind of security and stability. So I think we want to make sure people have that security and stability, and then we can bring those services there, including things like IDs. We continue to hear about the dysfunctionality of that system. Accessing services is critical, and there doesn't seem to be a standard, effective way to understand what services and resources are out there. So how do you think about that dysfunctionality and think about a place potentially for innovation? There's an organization called Built for Zero, which does this around the country, and their basic innovation is which seems also clear, you should know who everybody is and you should know their names and you should know as much as you can about their stories and about their needs. If we want to get in touch with you next week about a service, how should we find you? Uh, If you don't have a phone, who's the person that we can reach? Is there a place we know we can leave information for you? Are there shared mailboxes we can establish for people so they can get drop boxes? Are there shared email accounts we can give people access to? And then terminals to access that email. So I think the we should look at what the emergency first steps are to be able to reopen that communication with people and then be able to start communicating services through those and see what works the best and what doesn't. I think even on these micro communities, do we look at issuing uh, phones to people that don't have them? Because at this point, the amount we can save on the cost of social services from trying to chase someone every day around the city to offer them a service versus knowing for 30 bucks a month, we have a reliable place we can reach you is a massive savings for a city that's spending tens of thousands of dollars on people to not be able to provide ongoing services to them. So I think there are some common sense things we could do to make it much more effective and simpler. Yeah, this is such a, you know, this is what we've been doing since the beginning of time, I fear, right? We say, oh, I see the problem and I shall build the solution that will work for you. And then we'll discover that it created serious inequities. It had uh, underlying race bias in it and gender bias and And I think we got to break free of structuring our systems based on what we think works and start structuring our systems based on what people who are living uh, in the experience can tell us works. And this is where I'll just honestly tell you, I don't know those answers today, but I do know if we're going to build this right and really make it a system that works, this is where we have to partner with people who are unhoused, both historically, but also current to help us build a system that they can actually navigate and really meets their needs. And I'd be committed to doing that. Otherwise, I think we're, frankly, not using our resources smartly. You know, you mentioned that there will be an intense amount of resources devoted to this issue. You also mentioned coalition building and bringing folks together. And I'm just thinking about that. Those are core beliefs of ours, too, that systemic solutions are needed. It's going to require everybody at the table, including lived experts. And there's big solutions and there's micro solutions, too. But one thing I'm curious about is how do you, um, both from a financial budgetary standpoint and just from a facilitative standpoint, think about addressing um, some of the sort of proprietary and scarcity mindset issues that exist within the nonprofit sector? I hear a couple of issues here. One is people perceive maybe that um, we've built this complex where people have become very dependent on the payments the city makes to them. And so there's distrust that we're spending those dollars appropriately, that we're spending them with the right uh, service providers. I look at that as I don't know if there's truth to it, but I do know regaining people's confidence and trust is critically important. So one of the things I would do is work on making sure we could rebuild that confidence about how we're spending the resources and the return we get for it and and really trying to help show it. Um, The scarcity mindset, I think, is harder um, because I think we approach most things in life as if it has to be impossible to do what we're setting out to do. I would say anybody who looked at me as a young girl would have said there is no way she's going to do the things she has ended up doing in her life. Their mindset would have been she doesn't have the resources, the capacity. I mean, I'm dyslexic. I had a hard time in school. Um, I didn't read till third grade. My family received assistance. Uh, My family's had a tough go of it with um, addiction and suicide and um, losing my father to violent crime. I, I share this with you because a scarcity mindset would say 
you should give up uh, at any one of those points. I look at Denver today, and what I see is the same strength and resiliency I see in my family. Uh, To me, that's what I have to help people see as a path forward. I'm not putting aside, we need real resources, people need real support, but I also know we're capable of doing it. We've done great things in our history, and I think it's a leadership commitment that says, I'm going to help you see a path and remove this notion that it's too hard or too impossible or not your responsibility. I think there is a challenge where we can get into our own turfs on this, and the city does it on believing we need to own everything, run everything, control everything, and nonprofits do it on a, there are a limited number of resources out there and we have to fight to get them. Um, I want to bring a more holistic approach, which is to lay the problem out in front of all of us and say, here is the shared need that we all have, and there is a lot of need to cover here, and where do we think we each fit? Uh, in this broader circle because uh, it's, no one of us is going to do it alone. Uh, and there may be places where there are multiple organizations that want to provide the same service. And there the question is, how do we give them the opportunity to do that? Um, but how do we give the opportunity to make sure that we are finding the partners that are delivering the best possible results for those that need it the most? And I think one of the, the things I love about the way you all have approached this is I also think that involves a lot of early testing and early learning rather than saying, let's roll out a $200 million program to do this. It is, let's try this uh, with 10 people in one neighborhood and one strategy and see if that strategy works. Um, Sometimes government will just jump into a massive strategy without even knowing if it works firsthand. I met an amazing woman last week in in one of the uh, encampments on 22nd and Tremont who uh, she thought they needed a trash can because there was no trash uh, capacity. So she called the city asked for a trash can, gave them a fake address, which is the address roughly where they were. They showed up with the trash can and she was there and they said, wait, this, this isn't a house. And she said, well, it's my house. But she said, it's, you all have a choice. You can deny me the trash can and this will all just go on the street or you can give me the trash can and I'll actually put stuff in it. And they're they, hard for them to argue with that. They gave her the trash can. She, by the way, pays $20 a month for the use of that trash can to keep her own neighborhood clean. And everyone else in that encampment uses her trash can. Like, it would be good to, she just created a pretty good pilot for us, which is, hmm, maybe we should actually provide trash service to each of these locations in the city. And maybe we could cover that cost as a way to save ourselves tens of thousands of dollars of cleanup we're doing. How do you plan to regularly engage lived experts, people who are or who have been unhoused, and utilize their experience as you develop approaches and policies related to homelessness? For me, it starts with just being in conversation with people as regularly as possible. And that is talking to someone you see on the street, it's stopping by shelters, it's getting to people when they're uh, at meals, and being able to ask them some questions. What's working for you? What's not? What would you like to see us do better? What are you missing? Uh, How are the services we're providing not helping? How would they be more helpful? Um, And so for me, it's always pursuing those conversations as regularly as I can. Um, And then I think also partnering with the providers who are providing the direct services to listen to them, to say, what's working for you? What are the ways that the city's making it difficult to get resources or deliver services or provide what you know people need? I'll be convening a a weekly stakeholder meeting that I will lead personally myself every single week um, uh, of the first year when I take office. And that will be a chance for us to get regular feedback on, okay, here's what we rolled out this week. How did it work? What worked? What didn't? What do we need to change? Uh, what holes do we have? Because I think a big part of this is is communication and partnership and coalition. I think what I've heard from a lot of the providers and from uh, the people currently experiencing homelessness is there does not feel like a unified, organized effort that is combining all the services into one uh, kind of ladder of intervention and support. And I think that's the city's obligation to be that convener because we have the most resources and the most people and the most branches of city government that might touch all these individuals. And we've got to make sure those are all aligned. So I would do it similar to how I've done in other systems when I'm trying to um, figure out how to address inequities or um, bias in the systems that, you know, I'm responsible for. And how I've done it in the past is create a stakeholder committee or group who is helping you build but also unbuild, which I actually think is almost the harder part of all of this of saying break that down, remove that, stop doing that. Um, And so I would see it as an ongoing expertise who's helping guide us that we could bring um, issues to and ask them to help us build or unbuild what we need to do. And it would be regular meeting um, that we're inviting together. 
Uh, and and I would partner with um, uh, people working in the space, both the nonprofits, uh, but also there's so many people who have come out of being unhoused who are turning around, providing direct service to people who are unhoused today. I think they could help us identify who should serve on that. Uh, what does that service look like that's not too burdensome either? But I would structure an ongoing oversight committee basically to help. Just thinking about a stakeholder group that engages lived experts, how would you approach really building and maintaining trust with those individuals and also shifting power so that they're able to really fully participate in spaces where traditionally the power would be with other folks in the room? Mm-hmm. I'd ask folks like you who are spending your lives trying to do it, Um, to make sure we structured it correctly. But I can almost guarantee you, however we structure it out of the gate, I'm going to get it wrong. But that's the reality, right? We will miss uh, pieces. We will build it a little wrong. And so mostly what I would commit to is to change it quickly uh, because the goal here is to build a system that helps people find the path uh, for themselves. And I I can't build that without them. And so I need to even their help in building what's the system look like that they help, you know, engage in this work. So two ways. One is I feel like it's important to have as many direct private conversations with people who are unhoused as possible, because I think people are most honest when they don't have to be in front of a stakeholder room of 20 other people. Um, And so I want people at the broader table, but I also really value making sure there are direct personal conversations I can have. And I know that, you know, what I know from the folks that I've talked with who are unhoused is if you know one person who's unhoused, you know one person who's unhoused. You know, there are a thousand different stories to what might have brought you to the current situation. And there is no, oh, I talked to one person and now I know the solution is X. It is a matter of getting to know all the different stories. So I feel like it's my obligation, and it's the obligation of anyone that works in our administration, to have as many of those conversations personally as you can. And I put myself in places where I can do those. How will you increase the number of peer professionals and other lived experts to serve the unhoused? Yeah, for me, those people are often the ones that have the most rich combination of both experience and expertise because they both had the experience of living through that situation and the expertise of helping others work through it. And so they tend to see both the individual stories and the systems change that are needed at the same time. And so I was just visiting one of the Colorado Village Collaborative sites there and was talking to one of those navigators who was giving really great advice on structure and systems and funding and things we can change. And so I think those are uh, incredibly important uh, people, ones I would want close to me in terms of influencing our policy decisions. We're going to put a tremendous amount of resources into this. And this is a great opportunity for how people move up the ladder of opportunity. You know, you take a group of people that are currently unhoused, we're working hard to provide those folks services, as they get stabilized and up on their feet and they're thinking about what jobs they want to enter or what careers they want to pursue, we hope a significant number will choose this role of navigator. And we know we're going to have a massive demand for these types of staff members. I mean, if we're going to go from one or two of these communities to 15 or 20, we got a 15 times the number of peer navigators we currently have working in these sites. I think this is our hope is that the very way that we're providing services should be the way that we're cultivating and developing peer navigators to then staff the next site that we try to open as we expand. I'll share with you uh, a real huge bias I have, and that is, um, you know, in Europe and South America, you see paid apprenticeships and paid internships for high school kids. And when you use the word peer, I hear uh, young people whose families may be on the edge or, uh, or maybe have even been unhoused. And, um, and I'm really interested in hiring our kids. So the city of Denver can't fill about 10% of its jobs today. That's well over 1,000 jobs. And our kids need to often work in high school or have these experiences. I, I believe there's probably... Um, people who have been unhoused who are still looking for an opportunity to work, and I see it similarly, where we could say, we're going to hire you into these paid internships and apprenticeship opportunities, expose you to careers and uh, networks who can help you throughout your life, Uh, but I think even more importantly, expose us as city employees to innovative thinking, uh, breaking down systems that we have built that have cultural barriers, where having people inside your organization helping you just see all the barriers we have created, um, but also earning while they're probably learning and advancing their own lives and where they want to go, I think is invaluable for everybody. We know many of the dollars currently devoted to homelessness is to keep people in their current housing situation. 
How do you plan to prevent people from becoming unhoused? As I have spent time trying to look at what would I do as mayor to try to help improve the situation we all are in, um, I looked around the nation at other cities and what they're doing. And some of the cities that are making much more headway than we are started to focus on prevention to a much greater degree. And what I discovered very quickly is it would not only easier uh, to keep someone housed than to try to help someone come out of homelessness, uh, but it was less expensive. Today, Denver has a budget in its housing stability uh, department that's $254 million. And so I look at that budget, and when you look at these other cities, they have partnerships like with a landlord where the landlord calls the city first, and together you keep someone housed by the city, paying often very small amounts of money that keep someone housed instead of them being evicted. In Charlotte, North Carolina, um, I had mentioned I'm interested in trying to engage the private sector. Here's what they did there. The business community came together and formed a nonprofit And that nonprofit underwrites the risk of rehousing someone in an existing vacant apartment. They'll pay the deposit. They'll pay their rent if they can't afford their rent. They'll even pay if they have to be evicted. And so landlords will take the risk of rehousing someone. And it's hugely successful. I think almost 90% of the people they rehouse that way signed a second year lease. And it costs like $1,000 per person per year. So much more productive. I'm also interested in master lease programs where I, as mayor, would master lease, basically buy down rent uh, by, you know, renting a number of apartments off the market today, pass those savings on to our residents. But the thing I love most about it is it's like I'm the second on that lease. So before someone's evicted, I get a phone call and I get to say, keep Kelly housed will pay that cost instead of somebody being directly evicted. I think things like that could really help. I find you learn so much if you listen to other people about what's working. Um, And so there are people in the city that have created great solutions, and this is a good example of one of them. Uh, There's an organization here called the Eviction Defense Project, which you probably know. But uh, when I was at Gary, they came to us very early with this idea. And as they said, we have these folks that are about to get kicked out of their rental units because they missed uh, rent for 500 bucks. Now, landlord's going to kick them out over 500 bucks. Landlord's never going to get that 500 bucks back from them because now they're unhoused. And then the landlord's going to have a unit that sits vacant for two or three months till they lent it out again. So this landlord's going to lose 1,500 bucks uh, over kicking this person out, and this person's going to be unhoused. That's a, a lose-lose. So what they instead did is raised a fund that's kind of a revolving loan fund where they say, okay, how about this? How about we agree we'll pay you 300 bucks, landlord, for this person to stay in, that saves you the 1500 you'd lose. We'll loan this person the 300 to pay that bill. And when she can pay us back one month, six months, nine months from now, no problem. She can pay us back with no interest or low interest. And this fund can revolve to just support other people that are at risk of being unhoused. It's just such obvious math. It's both the right moral thing to do and it's the right financial thing to do. And you can prevent uh, tons of people from getting evicted. So those are the kind of things I would want to roll out citywide and say we should make sure that no one has to get evicted because it's going to be worse for the landlord and far worse for the tenant. How do you plan to bring our unhoused neighbors into the fabric of our community? This is what I love the most about the idea of the micro communities is right now you have a population of maybe 1,400, 1,500 people who are unhoused, mostly concentrated in downtown Denver, mostly having to sleep on sidewalks or under bridges. And the community's interaction with them is a big, nameless, faceless, maybe scary mass of people they don't understand. Um, When you bring back the humanity of these individuals and you put them in uh, communities that offer dignity and stability, you have your own home in a micro community with 40 people, you got a shower, you got a kitchen, you got all the things that you need. Then suddenly neighbors interact with you again like neighbors uh, because you're decorating your tiny home with Christmas decorations just like the folks down the block are. Um, I think that gets back a sense of every neighborhood has a community that is getting back on their feet uh, and that are neighbors just like you and much easier to interact and build the kind of authentic community relationships you have when it's neighbor to neighbor as opposed to one neighborhood that's carrying the bulk of the services without engagement or support or connection from a lot of the rest of the neighborhoods. First, they are part of the fabric of our community today. Um, I actually think this is part of what we have to change, this notion that they're not part of our community. Um, You know, one of the things I feel very strongly about that I started to notice uh, as I started this journey is even five years ago, 
if you would have saw someone lying on our sidewalk not moving, you would never have walked by them. You would have stayed there and got them help. Um, to me, I want to return to that moment where we say, oh, yeah, everyone is part of our community. And, uh, and I take responsibility in every moment of my life to make sure they're okay and getting the support and help they need. Uh, I get you're probably asking me longer term how we help people find their path uh, back to what they want to be doing and to the life they want to live. I'm committed to doing that. I know that path is going to be one that we only find together, but I honestly think it begins by us saying, I say hello and good morning. I make eye contact. I stop when someone needs my help. Uh, and that's how we begin the path back to ensuring everybody feels they're part of our community. So what about the people that have the bias towards um, the unhoused, regardless of them progressing and showing their dignity? How are you going to go about reaching them and, and educating them on how to treat the unhoused or the previously unhoused? This is exactly why Governor Polis uh, proposed a land use bill right, that said we should have housing that's affordable in every neighborhood in our state. Um, this is why we have such a challenging time building the kind of housing we need throughout our city. I will tell you the thing I think that changes people's minds is the courage to say we're going to do this. We are going to house and, sh and shelter people throughout our city. We are going to have affordable housing that has mixed income and that creates true community. We know social capital is what makes a city really work. And that means you build your neighborhoods with intention so that you have, you know, a vast array of people living in those neighborhoods, helping, supporting each other, getting to know each other right on the ground. I think the only way you make that happen is the courage of our elected officials uh, to say, I will stand right there to approve the zoning, to move people in and to be the first one who greets them and shows the community how you engage. And, and what we will all discover is it was really beautiful and it was just fine. And it's exactly what a city should look like. But I think the only way we get there is by a little bit of the standing up to the pressure and opposition and just keep going. Yeah, I, I think that what we found is there can be sometimes fear or trepidation before because people don't know what to expect. Um, once these communities are present and people get to actually know them, then humanity takes over in a very powerful way. So I know there will be some resistance at the front end. A lot of these neighborhoods where we have vacant lots, where the city has vacant lots, are maybe light residential, light industrial. They're close to transit or other options, uh, but, it's, but it's a place where uh, there's not a current good use of that land. And actually to put dignified, stable homes onto that site with people that are bringing life to the neighborhood can be a benefit, um, not at all a, a detriment. And so I think it's a matter of engaging communities up front, talking to them about them, let them have some input onto where we're going to site these, and then have the chance early on to bring them in and build relationships. I think it's a matter of us calling the rest of the community to say, uh, we're all a part of helping deliver this solution, and we want you to be included. I do think people actually want to be included, want to have a call to service, want to do their fair share. They just haven't known exactly how to do it yet. If you are Denver's next mayor, tell us one thing that would make you feel like you've been successful. I feel like we would have been successful if four years from now, maybe even three years from now, we could walk out of this office and we could walk 30 blocks in any direction, Curtis Park, Arapahoe Square, downtown, Cap Hill, at seven o'clock on a Friday or a Saturday or a Sunday night, and you would not see anybody who has to sleep on the streets. Like, that's the vision of Denver that I think is entirely possible, and that's the vision I'm running for mayor to deliver, because I believe we can be the city that's both great and good. Like It's a place that actually meets the fundamental needs of those that uh, have the least right now and delivers a very different path to recovery for them and a very different sense of possibility for the city. And I deeply believe that's possible, and that's what I will fight every single day to deliver. Probably my highest priority is that um, people don't die unhoused on our streets. And then, of course, that we actually house and shelter everyone. And and then I could add, you know, my vision of Denver is actually not mine. It's shared by meeting with so many people throughout our city and this recognition of what really makes a city beautiful, what really makes it work, is when you build a city where we are truly in community living together, uh, where you're checking on your neighbor to make sure they could shovel their walk, and if they couldn't, you did it for them. Uh, to make sure the elderly person on your block 
uh, got food uh, if they couldn't get out because of snowstorms. Um, that when somebody lost their job, you're jumping in to help them refer them to where there's opportunities or introduce them to employers. Today, I think we're losing completely both the sense of community, but also the integration of the lived experiences um, that are also different for all of us and make our life richer. I suppose my ultimate success is that I get to help build a city that returns uh, social capital where the zip code you're born in is not the number one predictor of where you end in your life. Thank you so much. Thank you to Kelly Bruff and Mike Johnston for taking the time to be with us today. And thank you to Warren Village and Rose Community Foundation for supporting this episode and believing in our work. Tune in next time and don't forget to vote. The Elevated Denver Podcast is produced by Leanne Morrison, Myra Nagy, and Jonna Flood. Editing, sound design, and music are composed and provided by Jesse Boynton. Recording and production provided by House of Pod. If you found this episode interesting and would like to learn more about our work, please visit us at elevateddenver.co. And don't forget to let others in the community know about this podcast. It's going to take all of us to build an elevated Denver.